understand today because we've been taught for over two generations not to respect authority. But sin is sin. It is an unspeakable crime because of the excellencies, the infinite goodness of the God against whom it is committed. That's one of the reasons why hell is hell. Because of whom we've committed our rebellion against. Do you see that? It's the excellency of his person. That's why a person cannot, even a believer, cannot come to understand how horrible sin truly is unless they have a biblical understanding of God's worth, which, which requires that they be greatly instructed in the attributes of God. Now let's go back and look at this one more time just for a moment. Most people have never in their entire Christian life been through a serious study of the attributes of God. Now think about it. Sometimes people think that the church is weak and that that weakness is a mystery. Why is the church so weak? Well, let me give you a silly illustration. If you came to me and you had a bloody forehead, it was bruised and bloody and sore and swollen, and you tell me, Brother Paul, this has been going on now for, for over a year. And I said, really? And he said, yes, I've gone to the doctors and they, they don't know what's wrong with me. And then you say, Brother Paul, you're a praying man. Would you just pray about it and maybe observe me? Maybe God will show you what's wrong with me. And I say, sure. So I start the next day following you around. I'm actually there at one o'clock in the morning while you're sleeping and I watch you. And when the clock strikes one, dong, you rise up out of bed, you go over to a solid brick wall and you slam your head against it. And then you go back to bed. I'm taking notes. <laughs> and then the clock strikes two. And you get up and you go over to the wall and you smack your head twice against the wall. By 12 o'clock in the afternoon at lunch, it hits 12 times. You immediately rise up and hit your head against a wall 12 times. Well, I'm taking notes. And then about 9 or 10 o'clock in the evening, I approach you and I say this. Look, I'm no doctor but I think I figured out your problem. If you would quit smashing your head against the wall, I would just bet you that your head would heal. All right, that's about how obvious our problem is in evangelicalism today. Why are we so weak? We don't know God. Even people who claim to be students of the scriptures, if I ask them, how many years of your life have you dedicated to studying who God is? Most of them will look at me quite bewildered and say, well, years. I don't think I've heard but a couple of sermons my whole life on who God is. Do you see that? A people who do not know their God. The book of Daniel says it's the people who know their God that will be strong, that will do great things. It is also, according to the book of Psalms, it is the knowledge of God that keeps us from sinning. When we think God is like us, then we think our sin is not that bad. And so not only did we discuss the moral depravity of men, but we put it in light of God and in light of the judgment of God, that because of sin, God is angry. He is angry every day. It's what the Bible teaches. And his mercy restrains his anger and the revelation of his hatred and wrath towards evil. And his mercy calls out for men to come. But one day, God will no longer call men to come, nor will he restrain his wrath. But judgment will fall upon the earth to such a degree that the greatest men of this world will cry out for the mountains and rocks to fall upon them, to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, having said that, after verse 23, Paul now is going to speak about 
the Christian. He's going to show a, a great contrast between what we were as sinners and what we are now as Christians. And in verse 24, he says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Being justified. Now, there's another thing. How many people truly understand what the word means? So many people think that justification refers simply to being forgiven. But that's not true. That doesn't even begin to touch the tip of this great mountain of the Christian faith. What does it mean to be justified? Well, let's look at what it does not mean. It does not mean that the moment a person believes God, that they are made into a righteous being. Because if that were the case, then everyone who believed God would no longer sin. The moment a person believes, justification does not mean that at that moment they are somehow transformed into a perfectly righteous being. That's not what it means. It also does not mean what some religions have thought it to mean, that the moment you believe in Jesus, God infuses you with some sort of grace that enables you to live a perfectly righteous life before him. That's not what it means either. Justification is a legal or a forensic term. Forensic having to do with the field of legality, of, of legal. It is a legal declaration. The man who believes God, God legally declares that person to be right with him, perfectly right with him. Okay? So that's the first thing I want you to see. The person who believes God, as Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, the just shall live by faith. So the moment a person believes God, God legally declares them to be right with him. And then another very important phrase that's oftentimes left out. He legally declares them to be right with him and he treats them as right with him. His relationship is now governed by that. He declares them legally right and he treats them as right. Do you see that? Don't forget those two things. They're going to be especially important when we come to the cross. All right, now, the believer standing before God is a perfect justification. He legally declares you to be right, perfectly right before him. If that were not the case, you could not be before him. You see, you can't be before him with one stain. You can't be before him with one sin. Adam and Eve for proof of that. Plus the rest of the scriptures testify to that. So when he says he legally declares you to be right, it's not partly right. It's not somewhat right. It's not 99.9% .9 right. It is perfectly and completely right so that you can be in that relationship with him. The one that Adam and Eve lost by only one single violation of his law. OK, now. This is one of the things that people mostly do not understand. We've already learned from uh, Romans 3 that there is none good, no, not one. So we know that anyone who says they're good, they do not understand their own predicament. But let's just put before, let me just put before you a hypothetical situation. Let's say someone was good, as men define good. No one would dare say they were sinless, even those who believe they're good. So they think that they can come before God being sort of righteous. But that's not the case. You can only come before God with absolute perfection. Let me give you an illustration. Um, I had a friend who taught me this, and it's a it's really good way to witness sometimes. Um, I'm on a plane and I open up my Bible. Sometimes on a plane, I'll take my Greek New Testament so that when I open it up and lay it on the little table there, people will go. 
They'll want to know, what, what are you reading? Is that Russian? What is that? And I'll say, no, no, it's Greek New Testament. And then maybe begin to talk to them about, about the Lord. And I've had guys ask me this question. And again, I learned this from a friend of mine, Mike Durham. They'll ask me, well, what do I got to do to go, go to heaven? So I'm, I'm looking down, I'm looking at my Bible, and they'll go, well, what do I got to do to go to heaven? And I'll go, um, oh, that's easy. You just have to be absolutely morally perfect from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death. And then I just go back reading. <laughs> and I'll see them out of the corner of my eye. They're like... <laughs> And then they'll, now, how is it that you can go to heaven? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you must be morally perfect without any moral blemish, flaw, sin, whatever you want to call it, just act of disobedience. You must be absolutely perfect before God your entire life, from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death. And then I just go back reading. And then a lot, one time I had a guy go like this. Hey! Hey, that that's not possible. And I said, yeah, you got a really big problem, don't you? And I just I just kept reading my Bible. Now, it was not to make light of his inquiries. It was simply to prove a point. You hit it right on the head, sir. It's impossible. It's not going to happen at all. It's not possible. It's impossible. And there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. You are lost. You are condemned. And you have no hope whatsoever unless God moves on your behalf. You see that? That's the whole purpose of the law. To literally incarcerate a man so that he cannot escape. Because if you give man a little bit of room Give him just a little idea that he might be able to justify himself. He'll escape. And the law's purpose is to take that away from him. Now, with regard to justification, I want you to see something. This is one of the things that separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world. If you were to take a comparative religion class with me, it would be actually quite simple. Because in reality, there are only two religions in the whole world. Now, people say, no, there's countless religions. No, there's just two, really. You can put them in two categories. All the religions of the world are religions of works. You do this and you earn salvation. Only Christianity, true Christianity, is a religion of grace. That salvation is not of works, and therefore no man can boast. Uh, let's say that I had a, um, an Orthodox Jew here. I said, sir, if you... And I was the reporter interviewing him, and I said, sir, if you died right now, where would you go? And he might say, well, I would go the way of the righteous. Go to paradise. Why? Well, I love the Torah. I love the law of God. Um, I, I'm a righteous man. OK. If I come to the Muslim and I say, sir, if you died right now, where would you go? He might say paradise. Why? I love the Quran. I've made the pilgrimages, the daily prayers. I've given alms. I am a righteous man. You come to the Christian, the true one. Sir, if you died right now, where would you go to heaven? Why? Now, here's the difference. And the Christian says, In sin did my mother conceive me, and in sin was I born. I have violated every command of my God. And right there as a reporter, I stop him and I say, Hey, hey, hold it. The other two guys, I understand. They're going to heaven because they deserve it. They're going to heaven because they've earned it. But you, I don't understand. You're telling me you're going to heaven while at the same time you're telling me you deserve actually the very opposite. You deserve condemnation. So, sir, how are you going to heaven? These men claim to go to heaven based upon their own virtue and merit. 
but you claim to have no virtue or merit. How are you going to heaven? And the Christian responds, because I'm going to heaven upon the virtue and the merit of another, Jesus Christ, my Lord. And this is the reason why the Christian is the only person who can claim to go to heaven and not be boasting. Because he is also claiming he has nothing to do with his own right standing before God, that it all has to do with Christ. Now, let me put a little parenthesis in here that's very important. All I've described to you right now is justification. I do not want you to think that after a person is truly justified, that they go on living a life of law-breaking and sin. That is not true. But I'm just pointing out that salvation is never earned by anything the Christian has done, but what has been done for him in Jesus Christ. Okay? This is very, very important that you understand it. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Jesus is my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. It's Christ alone, Christ alone, Christ alone. And this is the amazing, this is, this is why I so appreciate the life of Martin Luther. This is where I see a genuine work of God. It was revealed to him in his own conscience, even before he, a New Testament was placed in his hands, that all his good works were like filthy rags and he could find no peace. And they would, they would say, but you're the, you're the holiest guy here. And still he could find no peace. They would give him works to do, scrubbing floors, penance, all kinds of things. But still he found no peace. Nothing will take away my sin. And he saw God as he is, against sin and full of wrath. But it was when a New Testament got into his hands that he understood that Christ was the sin bearer and because Christ has paid for our sin, the just can live by faith. An atonement, a sacrifice, has been made. Now, it says here in verse 23 or 24, being justified as a gift by His grace. Now, this is somewhat redundant. Being justified, it's almost like saying being justified as a gift, as a gift. Now, Right here in our text, it says being justified as a gift. The word translated is dorian in Greek. And it's a word that is used in another place in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the Gospel of John, with reference to the Messiah. And it says basically, they hated me without a cause. The Messiah is speaking, they hated me without a cause. Now what does that mean? The Messiah, Jesus Christ, never sinned against anyone. He never gave anyone a reason to hate him. And that's the meaning here. God saved us. He justified us, even though we never gave him a cause to do it. The only thing we ever gave God reason to do is condemn us. So he saved us, not because of us, but in spite of us and because of him. This is very important truth. Let me say it again. If you see anything other than a monster in a man, it is only because of the restraining grace of God that keeps that man from looking like well, making Hitler look like a choir boy. God did not have to save us. If he did not save us, he would have still been God. He would have still been love. And he would have give, he would have had no need of giving any explanation. He did not save us because of some inherent worth in us or some moral virtue 
are something good found in any of us. No reason whatsoever. God saved us because of God. God loved us because God is love. Now see, that's hard for us to understand. Why? Because our love is not a godlike love. For, for the most part, we love because the person that is the object of our love has something that draws out our affections. If you fell in love with your wife, it's probably because if you're a normal man, she was nice to you. She talked nice to you. Now, I would I would bet that you would never have walked down that aisle if when you met her, she hit you with a two before. And then every time you saw her, she said bad things about you, kicked you and spit on you. I would just about assume that you probably wouldn't marry that woman. But she was nice to you. And she was nice looking to you. And so her virtue and whatever thing that she had that was positive drew out your affections. There was nothing in you to draw out God's affections and to cause God to love you. Now, a lot of people get mad about that. But for me, I take great joy in that. Because if there if he loved me, even though I gave him no reason, he loves me now, even when I fail. His love for me is not dependent upon me. And that's good because I'm always changing. I'm mutable. But his love is constant because he is never changing. He is immutable. You see that? That's a good thing. It's a good thing. If our relationship was 50-50, I would be in terror constantly. Because I'm not going to hold up my 50%. But if our relationship entirely depends upon him, well, that's another thing. You see. If salvation was 99.9999999% God and the rest of it was your obedience, you would have no hope except for hell. So, he says, being justified as a gift by His grace, His unmerited favor. And then it says, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, and we're going to talk about the phrase Christ Jesus right now, in Christ Jesus. And, and this is, let me put it this way. A young man came up to me one time after I was preaching, and he said, Brother Paul, Jesus is all we need. And I said, young man, Jesus is all we have. Outside of him, we have nothing. You see, you were born into this world, according to Romans chapter 5, you were born in Adam, in the sphere of his sin, his condemnation, and death. When you are born again, when you believe, you are placed into the sphere of being in Christ. Where instead of condemnation, there's justification. And instead of death, there is life. But it is only in being in Christ. In Christ. Our identification with Jesus is what saves us. Nothing else. Now, now we're going to address the greatest problem in all the Bible. If I, if God had not saved anyone and condemned us fully and completely, he would not have need of giving any explanation. He wouldn't. But because he has saved us, there is need to give explanation. Now, here's the problem. If God is just, he cannot forgive you. Now, I know this is very hard for our culture to understand because we have no sense of righteousness and we always make excuses 
for sin. For example, in the United States, if a student fails and fails to do his work and fails to do his work at the end of the semester, he can usually go to the teacher and say, give me, can you give me an extra assignment so that I can improve my grade? It's always something at the end that can save somebody. Or if someone goes into a McDonald's and takes a gun out and kills several people, he says, it wasn't my fault. It's because when I was a little boy, my parents never took me to eat at McDonald's. <laughs> no, seriously. There's always an excuse for sin. There's always a way around it. But here's the problem. God's not like you. God is righteous. God's not evil. He's righteous. And so the greatest problem, and please, this is not hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating. The greatest problem in the entire Bible, what the entire Bible is all about, the reason it was written, and the entire reason for the gospel is this one dilemma. If God is just, He can not forgive you. And if He does forgive you, and declares you to be right, he's no longer just. And you say, well, I don't see why. Well, let's use a human example. Let's say that uh, um, a man breaks into your home and slaughters your entire family. And as you come home, you catch him strangling the life out of your youngest child with blood on his hands. You grab the man, you throw him to the ground, and you tie him up and you call the police. The police come, gather all the evidence. The man has murdered your entire family and he's taken to prison. Then he's brought out in order to have his day in court. And all the people in your village are there wanting to know what's going to happen. The judge comes in, he looks down at the man that slaughtered your entire family, wife and children, and he says this, I am a loving judge, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, full of patience. I forgive you. You're free to go. What's going to be your reaction and the reaction of the people in the village? They're going to say that this judge is just as corrupt as the man who murdered your family. Isn't that one of our great complaints? At least in all the places I travel around the world, especially in the third world, the greatest complaint is this. All our judges are corrupt. So now here's the question. You have violated every law of God. If God just forgives you, he's not just. If he lets you go, he is no longer a just God. Now, I want you to know something. I'll be very strict about this. If you think this is a minor detail, you understand nothing about the gospel and you understand nothing about the character of God. Now, I know those are hard words, but I've got to say it. See, that's why we can't understand the gospel. We think God's like us. Most people have never done a serious study of who God is. Now, I've heard evangelists say this, instead of being just with you, God was loving. They don't teach logic in school anymore, do they? Because the only conclusion there is this, then God's love is unjust. You see, God cannot ignore his justice in order to demonstrate his love. He cannot. He will not. One of the things, when, when you say God is perfect, most of the time what most people think is God doesn't sin. But you've got to see it goes so far beyond that. When, it, when, we, when the theologian says that God is perfect, it means that all his attributes exist in perfect harmony and that he will not ignore one attribute in favor of another. But there is perfect harmony in all that God is. He is loving, but he must be just in his love. He cannot deny his justice in order to manifest his love. Most people don't understand that, and therefore they can't understand the gospel. Now, I want us to go through the Bible 
And we're going to look at some things. I want us to start in the book of Exodus, chapter 34. And I want to demonstrate this problem. I want to demonstrate this problem. Exodus 34, verse 5. It says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him, that is with Moses, as he called upon the name of the Lord. Now, this is one of those rare instances in the Scriptures where God comes down and where God speaks for Himself and where God says, I'm going to tell you who I am. This Exodus 34 passage is on par with the Isaiah 6 passage. You know, in the year the king his eye died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train, the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraph, and each one having six wings. With two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And one cried unto the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. This is on the same level with that. Verse 6, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. That's a declaration of His sovereignty. And He says, Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. So far, so good. This is wonderful. This is absolutely beautiful. And then I want to to emphasize something. First, before he talks about forgiving, which is an action, he talks about his character. All of God's actions must conform to his character. Do you see that? That's why when people say, what is the standard for righteousness? You shouldn't just say the will of God even though that's true. It's better to be a little bit more holistic and say the character and will of God. All right, now, so he says all these beautiful things, and then in verse 7 he says, forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. What's going on here? This is very Hebrew, Hebrewish. And what do I mean by that? When When somebody from America wants to call attention to something, they raise their voice or they might put a marker through it or underline it or something. Uh, to the Jew, when he wants to emphasize something, he repeats it. Uh, we can even see this in the book of Proverbs with what we call Hebrew parallelisms, where it says, let me make one up for you. The wicked shall not dwell in the land, the wicked shall be cut off. I'm saying the same thing twice. I'm changing it a little to add specific emphasis or to define the first phrase with the second. Okay, so when you hear holy, 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 you always want to keep in mind above all things that we know about God, he's holy because he never says God is nice, nice, nice. He never says God is merciful, merciful, merciful. He doesn't even say God is love, love, love. He says God is holy, holy, holy. The one thing you want to know about God is, if anything, is that he's holy. Now here, he's doing something similar to what we see in the great command. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A lot of preachers will wrongly take that passage and divide, think they can divide up the human psyche into heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's not what Jesus is doing at all, so don't do that. What he's doing, again, is very Hebrew. He's saying he's piling one term upon another just to tell you, love God with everything you are. Okay, so if you wrestle that command into some Greek idea of a tripart man and all these different things, you've got problems. That's not what he's doing. He's just saying you love God with everything you are. Now, when he lists three kinds of sins here, He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Although we can look at each one of those in the Hebrew and find something a little bit different in each one, that the, that's not the point to give us a lesson in, in, um, in sin. The point is, he forgives all types and kinds of sin. And that's wonderful news, isn't it? Now, here's what I want to hold your attention on. So far, God has told us about his character, and then he says, I forgive all. Types and kinds of sin. But now let's go on with verse 7. Who forgives iniquity, 
transgression and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Do you see the problem? Do you see there's a, there's a contradiction here? He says, I forgive all types and kinds of sin. I forgive every kind of sin of the guilty, but I won't leave the guilty unpunished. There's your dilemma. Okay, we're not going to answer it yet, but do you see it? It's there. Okay? I forgive all types and kinds of sin, but anyone who commits all types and kinds of sin, I'm going to punish. Okay, that... We, we, we need some help on this. All right. Now let's go to Proverbs for a moment. Proverbs 17. In Proverbs 17, verse 15. In the Norwegian translation, it may be the same verse or one before it or one after it. I'm not sure. But in Proverbs 17, 15, it says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Now, do you know what that just said? Whoever justifies a wicked or sinful man is what? An abomination to the Lord. What is an abomination? Well, let's put it this way. It's the worst thing you can be. It's one of the strongest words in all the scripture, if not the strongest word. OK, negative term. So now here's another problem. We, we've already looked at Exodus and he says, I forgive all types and kinds of sin, but I'm going to punish everybody who's guilty. And then here we see another problem, because in Romans three, what did we learn? God justifies. Who does God justify? The wicked. But here it says in God's word that anyone who justifies the wicked is an abomination before God. I hope you're seeing the problem. This you want to talk about gospel 101 or the baby steps of the gospel. This is it. And yet most people have never even heard it. This is what the gospel is all about. So. God justifies the wicked and God says anyone who justifies the wicked is an abomination before him. God says he forgives all types and kinds of sins, but he punishes everyone who is guilty of all types and kinds of sin. OK, let's go to now to Romans for a moment. Let's go back to our place. We're going to go beyond Romans three. And I want us to look in Romans four. Verse 7, where Paul is quoting David. He says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. OK, now, does this sound to you like a righteous judge? A lawless man appears in front of him and he forgives him a lawbreaker. Not only that, but he covers his sins. In the United States, we have a saying, he sweeps it under the rug. And we use that type of terminology with corrupt judges. He just swept that under the rug so no one would see it. It's still there, but he hid it. That's not the language of a righteous judge of all the earth who will do right. This is not right. And so we come back to our question. How can God and Paul's going to say this, he's going to use this phrase. Look in Romans three. OK, look in Romans three and look in verse 26 for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justifier of the wicked. Paul is putting this in front of us and most people have never seen it. The question is, how can God justify the wicked and still be just? That is the question of the whole Bible. It's the reason why why lambs were slain and offered. It's the reason why heifers were killed. It's the reason why bulls were slaughtered. It's the reason for everything. This one problem. 
How can God be just and at the same time justify wicked men? Well, let's go on in Romans 3. It says, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Now, there's two words that stand out here. They may be two of the most important words in all of the Bible. With the exception of the name of God. One of them is redemption. And the other is propitiation. Those two words are absolutely essential to understanding the gospel. Now, let's look at them. Redemption. What does it mean? It means to pay a price in order to gain the liberty of a slave, a captive, or a prisoner. To pay a price. Now, who paid the price? Jesus Christ. What was the price? His death on Calvary. To whom was the price paid? Now here you must be careful or you'll find yourself in the camp of the heretical. In the early church, there was a heresy that sprung up that continues even till today. That because Adam had sinned, Adam and the human race were slaves to the devil. And when Jesus died on the cross, he made payment to the devil in order to set people free from him. That is heresy. There's even a film that I have seen where you see this sinner in a prison and he's chained to a wall and he's about to be beaten, whipped, and killed, you see this shadow coming towards him, and you see this whip about to fall down, and the narrator says, right before Satan came with his whip, Jesus stood between the sinner and Satan, and on the cross, Jesus suffered the whip. That is heresy. There was a whip, and there was someone coming against the sinner, and Jesus did stand in the place of the sinner in order to feel that whip across his back. But it wasn't the devil who had the whip in his hand. It was God. It was God's justice. It was God who was coming against the sinner. It was God who had to be paid. The justice of God. Because of man's sin... God's justice had been offended and demanded punishment, which was death under the wrath of God. In order to satisfy justice and appease God's wrath, Jesus Christ interposed and on the cross, he bore the sins of his people and all the wrath, furious anger of a holy and just God fell down upon the head of Jesus. And as Isaiah said, it crushed him for it pleased the Lord. It pleased Yahweh to crush him. So that is how we were purchased. Now, propitiation. It is a similar idea that God's justice had been offended by our evil and that his justice demanded our death. Now, not just a simple aorist tense once and for all death, not just dying physically, but the wrath of almighty God poured out on man eternally for the infinite crimes that men have committed against him. Now, in order for that wrath to be appeased, a sacrifice had to be given to satisfy God's justice. And that sacrifice was the death of Christ, a propitiation. A propitiation is a sacrifice that satisfies the demands of justice and appeases or calms the wrath of God. Now,
I want us to look for a moment at Christ as the sin bearer. I have I have many notes on this and, and studies, but for the most part, when I have a translator, I, I have to simplify it greatly because there's so much that has to be said. But I want to give you at least a general idea. Let's first look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God made him that is Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Now, first of all, let's look at this. He knew no sin. He lived in perfect conformity to the law of God. Now. In order to take that a step further and kind of show you exactly what we're talking about, I want you to think about something. Someone asked me one time, what is the greatest sin? And just kind of jokingly, you know, because that's really not a biblical question, but I threw out this answer. I suppose the greatest sin would be breaking the greatest commandment. And what is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, if I could come down there and sit right in front of you right now and take put both my hands on your shoulders and look you right in the eye, I would do it. But there's too many of you. Here's what I want you to see. There has never been one moment in your life that you have obeyed that command. There is not one moment in your life that you have ever loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Another way of putting it is there has never been one moment in your life that you loved God as God ought to be loved. If you say that you have, you've blasphemed. Not one moment. Now, let's put it all together. There's never been one moment in the thousands of years of human history, there has never been one moment in all of humanity, it's billions and billions of people, not for one second did anyone ever love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now look at this. There was never one moment that Jesus did not Love the Lord, his God, with all his heart, soul, mind and strength. You see what we mean by sinlessness now? It's not just some keeping of the law. We're talking about a per. He did every moment of his life what all humanity has failed at always. No one's ever for one second accomplished it. He was sinless. Now, another thing about sinlessness that that I want you to see and, and I don't probably don't have a lot of time to to go there, but I, I want to <laughs> I just want you to look at. Well, it says that he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. That's the writer of Hebrews. We don't have time to go through all of it, but that's what it says. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Also, we know from the account of Luke that he grew in stature, in, in everything. He, he grew. So here we have this, this Son of God that becomes a man. God the Son that becomes a man and is the God-man. But he's laid aside the privileges of his deity and he walks on this earth as a man. Never forget that. You see, the church, the true church, has always had to defend the deity of Christ. And in defending the deity of Christ, many times we've overlooked his humanity. He walked on this earth as a man. Now, When it says that he was tempted like us in every way, but without sin, again, many people don't think this through. And I'm going to use a weightlifting illustration, a powerlifting illustration in order to explain this to you. Now, let's say that uh, the Norwegian 
powerlifting champion in the squat is standing right here, and then there's me. Now, I'm old and skinny, but I can still handle myself, okay? All right, so you put an Olympic bar on my back, and you put an Olympic bar on his back. No sweat for him. No sweat for me. I'm looking good over here. Okay? Now, you take two plates, okay? You put a plate on one side and a plate on the other side of his. You put two plates on mine. I'm still okay. Okay? Now, you take two more plates and put it on him, and you've got 100 kilos, and you put two plates on me, and you've got 100 kilos. I'm still doing okay. He's still doing really okay. All right, now let's let's knock that thing up to two more plates. So now we got six plates on this, and it's I don't know what it is in kilos, but it's three hundred and five pounds. And there's and there's three hundred and five on me. I'm starting to sweat. Okay? Now we go to four plates. Put it on him. Now we're not going down, we're just standing there. Put on four plates. He's like this. I'm starting to tremble. You go to five plates. He's still standing. I'm going down. And he's still standing. And then you put on two more plates. He's still standing. You put on two more plates. He's still standing. You put on two more plates. He's still standing. That's what it means when Jesus Christ was tempted like us in all ways, but was without sin. It doesn't mean he was tempted to the same extent as all of us and remain sinless. We get tempted, we're gone. He gets tempted, he stays. The temptation gets harder, he stays. We've already fallen, all of us, all of humanity. Temptation gets harder. He stays harder again. He stays harder again. He stays. And I want you to look at it this way. When he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now think about this. He is sweating drops of blood. He is full of anguish, not because of a Roman cross. But because of the wrath of God that's going to be poured out on him. Now, I believe and I've seen this also among some Puritan writers. That as he grew in stature as a little boy and throughout his life and then into his ministry, I believe that something like this happened. Whenever it happened, it was revealed to him. He knew that he would redeem his people. It was like a jolt in his chest. Boom! And he said, not my will, but yours. And then as time went on, greater meaning as to what it would mean, what he would have to do, much more intense. It hit him in the chest like a truck. And he said, not my will, but yours. And then again, as he kept going in his life, it became fuller, more fully revealed to him what it would cost him in order to redeem his people. And it hit him in the chest like a truck. And he said, not my will, but yours. And then that last night in Gethsemane, the full force of what it would mean for him to die for his people, him becoming sin in their place, the father forsaking him and the father pouring out all his hatred upon his only begotten son. And it hit him in the chest like a semi. And he said, not my will, but yours. This is what we're talking about. It goes so far beyond what little cursory readings of the New Testament will give you. Each time harder, each time more intense, and each time he stood his ground where we would have fallen in the first few minutes. Now it says he was without sin, but then it says he made him sin on our behalf. Now what does that mean? Does it mean that when Jesus was on the cross that he became corrupted and, and dirty and filthy and vile or devolved morally? But, but you've got to answer this question. You read it, he became sin, and you just go on. You can't just go on. 
What does it mean? Well, the answer is actually found in the second part of this verse. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, let's go back to our definition. When a person believes God, they are legally declared to be right with God. And then what happens? They are treated that way. On the cross, Christ was legally declared guilty before God, and he was treated that way. And what does that mean? A couple of things. First of all, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've heard preachers say God looked down from heaven and he saw his son suffering on the cross and he couldn't bear to look at him. That's absolutely ridiculous. Jesus didn't say, why can't you look at me? He said, why have you forsaken, abandoned me? And here's why. Habakkuk tells us his eyes are too pure to look on evil. On that tree, Christ bore our sin. And the father turned away. Now, we're talking. Now we get into the idea of the relationship of the persons within the Trinity. God did not create the world because of some need that he had. If you ever tell your children God made them because he was lonely, you've blasphemed. The world is not a result of God having a need. The world is the result of God's super abundance. He had no need. The reason why he had no need is because God existed in a perfect relationship in the Trinity. The father delighting in the son, the son delighting in the father. The love of the Holy Spirit flowing through all. No need. Perfect contentment. The son was the pure satisfaction of the Father, and the Father the pure satisfaction of the Son. They needed nothing. But now, on that cross, it's broken. It's broken. The Son was always His delight. The delight of God, the delight of the Father, bearing the glory of the Father. But on that tree, it's broken. It's broken. I want you to just hold your place and go for a minute to Psalms 22. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Does that sound familiar? Christ is on that tree, abandoned of God. And he basically sets forth his complaint. He says, I cry out to you. There's never been a time in the history of your covenant people, Israel, that a righteous man cried out to you and you turned away from him. But I'm your son and I hang from a tree and you have forsaken me. Why? Then he goes on. He gives us the answer. Well, let's just read the whole thing in verse three. Yet you are holy and you are enthroned above the praises of Israel and you are fathers trusted. They trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them to you. They cried out and were delivered in you. They trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of the people and despised by the people. And what he's saying is what I said. He's arguing there's never been a time in history. All Israel has cried out to you and you delivered them. But I hang from a tree and you have forsaken me. Why? He gives the answer. Verse three, you are holy. Verse six, but I am a worm. He has become sin. He has been made to be sin on our behalf. Go to Isaiah chapter, uh, go to uh, Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three. Verse 10. 
For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Do you see what that says? Everyone is under a curse. Why? The only way to not be under a curse is you must do everything that was written in the law to perform it. And if you have not, you're under a curse. That puts all of us under a curse. Now, what does it mean to be under a curse? I want you to think about this. Would you have some idea about some, some witch giving you the evil eye? I mean, what do you think it means to be under a curse? It's to be under the band. What does that mean? Let me put it this way. The man who is accursed of God, the last thing he will hear when he takes his first step into hell is all of creation standing to its feet and applauding God because God has rid the earth of him. There's nothing worse. That's what it means to be under a curse. But now look at verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Your sin was heaped upon Christ. He became the sin bearer. He became the serpent lifted up in the wilderness. He became the scapegoat. It's amazing that that Levitical atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, that it took two goats to truly describe what happened to Jesus on the cross. The sins are imputed to the one goat and he is slain, dying for sin. The sins are imputed, imputed to the second goat and he is driven outside of the camp to wander in the wilderness and to die forsaken of God. So Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says, suffered outside the gate. Cut off from God's people. Cut off from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, bearing sin is something that you've always done. We no more sense the evil of sin than a fish understands that it's wet because it's all we've ever known. Let's say that one of you young ladies, maybe you've been raised in the church all your life. You've never watched television. You've uh, you've been trained properly at home. You're so delicate in your soul. Innocent as someone could be. As a human. And one day you decide to go to the major city here in Norway and witness to the prostitutes. And as you're handing out tracts, all of a sudden the police come by and round up all the prostitutes and throw them in the back of a big truck. And you're rounded up with them. The prostitutes, they're laughing. They've been through this a thousand times. You, you're over in the corner terrified. You're so ashamed. Then they bring you out of the wagon and bring you into the police station. They're taking your picture, their mug mugshot. They're pushing you around. They're saying terrible things about you. They throw you in the jail. Again, you look over and all the prostitutes are laughing, painting their nails, telling jokes, and you're over in the corner. You can't even breathe. You feel like you're, all your insides are going to come out and you're going to die. That doesn't even begin to describe Christ on a tree. Never knowing sin. He knew no sin. He knew no defilement. He never saw anything from His Father's face except the greatest, most affirming, loving smile. And on that tree He bore your sin and became accursed. Accursed of God. God and see, you can't understand the gospel 
with all this silly little preaching that goes on today. If you do not understand, that is why I spent so much time talking about the wrath of God, that he has sharpened his sword, that he's prepared his arrows, that he's angry always. Why? So that you would know what fell upon the head of Jesus. No wonder this silly little gospel they preach today, it has no power because it's not the gospel. So he bore our sin, became accursed, and then what? Father, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. What was in the cup? I remember hearing so many sermons that Jesus in his omniscience, he looked ahead and he saw the cat of nine tails coming down on his back and he saw the spear going into his side and the crown of thorns on his head and the nails in his hands. And he said, Father, take me away from that. That's not at all what is happening. Where do we come up with these romantic ideas? After the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension into heaven, for the next few centuries, countless Christians died on crosses. Some of them crucified upside down, some of them set on fire with a crude form of kerosene while they're hanging from the tree. Now, isn't it amazing that the history of martyrdom tells us that many of these Christians went to the cross with joy, singing hymns. So are you going to tell me that the followers of Jesus go to the cross, the Roman cross and the Roman whip and the Roman nails and all that, singing hymns and counting it joy, but their leader is so afraid he's cowering in a garden and bleeding drops of blood? Do you honestly think that it was a Roman cross? Now, I want to take nothing away from the physical sufferings of Jesus. Nothing. It was a bloody death. It had to be. It was horrifying. When they put him on that tree, you couldn't even recognize him in the form of a man. But that is not the reason for that prayer in the garden. It's amazing to me. All these people walking around like they're little theologians, and yet they can't even see what's going on here. I remember one time I was teaching, I went to teach at the chapel in a reformed school. That's um, a school based upon reformed theology, I guess you could say. And I was talking to the headmaster and he said, what will you be? I said, who will I be teaching today in chapel? He said, kindergarten to 12th grade. I said, well, that's kind of a wide group. He said, it won't be a problem. And he said, what are you going to teach on? I said, well, I was going to teach on propitiation. He said, excellent, excellent. It'll be very helpful for our children. And I'm thinking, I teach pastors about propitiation and they don't follow it. So I walked in there. I started teaching. And I, it was a large student body. And I looked at the student body and I said, can anyone tell me what was in the cup? And a little eight or nine year old girl raised her hand. And I said, yes. And, you know, in true fashion, she stands up, puts her little hand on the desk like this. And she goes, sir, the wrath of almighty God was in the cup. Behold, the wisdom of God. Sir, the wrath of Almighty God was in the cup. Wow. Isn't it amazing? 
sometimes sad. I see children in children's church, separated from elders and everything else, and never taught anything except how to paint pictures of Noah's Ark or Joseph's many-colored coat. Yes, my dear friend, your, your eight-year-old child can understand the cross. We need to return to catechizing and teaching our children. The wrath of Almighty God was in the cup. What is wrath? A Hebrew word that actually refers to the nose in one sense. Talks about basically the idea is a bull or a charging animal that is so furious its nose is, is flared out in anger. The wrath of God is the holy hatred of a righteous God against evil and against evil men. And in order for him to be able to forgive his people and still be just, someone had to suffer that wrath. And so on that tree, Christ bore our sin and his father turned his face from him and then his father crushed him under the full force of all his holy, just hatred against evil. I want you to think for just a moment that we're in a little village about about a half a kilometer from the base of a dam. And that dam is a mile high, a kilometer high. And that dam is a kilometer wide and it's full to the brim with water. And all of a sudden you're in your little hut there at the right at the bottom of that dam. And then all of a sudden you wake up to a sound crack and you run to the door and here comes this wall of water. It doesn't matter how fast you can swim, doesn't matter how strong your endurance, you're going you're not even going to be found. And right before that water hits you, the ground opens up and takes it down, and not one drop touches your pant leg. Imagine a millstone, 10,000 pounds, and on top of it, another millstone, and you have a little kernel of, of wheat, and you put it in there, and just for a fraction of a second, it holds its own, and then the hull bursts open, it's ground to powder, and when it comes out on the other side, there's nothing. This is what Christ did. The fury of God's wrath crushed him. Now, the Bible says that, that the mountains melt under the wrath of God, that the seas dry up under the wrath of God. Over and over it's asked, who can withstand the wrath of God? It is a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course, no one. But there is Christ literally engulfed, swallowed up, and crushed by the wrath of his own father. And you say, well, he could do that. He was God. That's true. But you're not understanding what you're saying. I want you to look at it this way. He was deity. He was deity. But here he is on the cross as a man. As a man. If you think his deity was covering him so that the wrath and the suffering would be less, you are wrong. But rather, I would look at it this way, that his deity was underneath him, sustaining him so that he would endure so that he could experience it as a. You have do you understand what I'm saying? That this man, as a man, endured the wrath of God, which would pulverize us in less than a second, but because his deity held him up and sustained him and kept him alive, he kept suffering and kept suffering. What no man can suffer for even a fraction of a millisecond. And then right before he died, he cried out, It is finished. Paid in full. He paid for our crimes against God. Now, I want just for a moment you go to an obscure passage in the book of Micah. Micah. 
Micah chapter 7. Verse 18. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession? You see, there we go again. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. Do you see that? There's a, there we are again with this problem. If he is just... How does he pardon iniquity? How does he pass over rebellion? How does he do this? Verse 19, he will again have compassion on us. How? He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now you listen to me. Do you know why we read passages like that? And we don't see because we don't read them in the context of Christ. Do you think that he's saying this? Now look, just watch me. This is so important. When most people read this, they think God takes your sin, throws it on the floor, and stomps it. Or God takes your sin, puts it on a ball, and throws it out into the sea. That's what most people think. And that's why there's no power in it. You see, you can't do that. The sin committed must be punished in the same stock in which it was committed. Man has done this. Man must die. So when it says he will tread our iniquities underfoot, you've got to see that in the context of Christ. He takes your sin off of you, but he doesn't throw it on the ground and tread it underfoot. He puts it on Christ and then treads him underfoot. Do you see that? And then he doesn't take your sin and roll it up in a ball and throw it in the ocean. They write all those silly songs about that. They're silly because it leaves Christ out. He takes your sin, rolls it up in a ball, puts it on Christ and throws Christ out into the ocean of his wrath. Now, do you remember when the apostles the disciples were growing across the sea with Jesus and there was a great storm. Do you remember that? And where was Jesus? Sleeping in the bow of the boat, sleeping in the boat. Now, why is that important? Remember Jonah? They're crossing the sea. Where was Jonah? When the storm started, sleeping in the bow, the boat. What's going on? Jonah, because he was a disobedient prophet, the wrath of God stirred up the sea. I want you to believe, I think it is true that when those apostles were going across that sea and Jesus is sleeping in that boat just like Jonah and that ocean came up, maybe that sea started moving. They may have thought exactly the same thing. Is this a Jonah? Have we followed a false prophet? This is exactly the same thing, the same scenario. And so the wrath of God is kindled against Jonah. And so they grab Jonah and they throw him into the wrath. They throw him into the sea and the wrath is calmed. Jonah was guilty. But in that boat,
Oh 